Good morning and welcome to the People's Church in Partington. I'm Steve, one of the members of the church, and it's great to have you with us today, whether you're joining live on Sunday morning or whether you're catching up on YouTube. Uh, great that you're joining us and um, we're going to be starting with worship in a moment and then hearing from God's word later on. Before we do that, I'd just like to encourage us with two verses from the Psalms that we've been looking at in the past two weeks. So firstly, Psalm 23 and verse 4 tells us, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Then Psalm 27 verse 1 tells us, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? These two verses are connected, I think, because um, we feel um, that we're under the shadow of the coronavirus. The weeks and the months have gone by um, and it still feels like we're under this shadow. But what we need to remember is that a shadow has to have light in order to be a shadow. And that light is bigger, greater um, and more expansive and transcends the shadow itself. And that light is God, as we hear in uh, Psalm 27, verse 1. So we can come through this together um, by focusing on God and his light. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you illuminate our darkness and you will guide us through the darkness that we find ourselves in. We praise you and thank you that we're not stumbling around in that valley of the shadow of death. We thank you that we're walking through it and we're going to come out the other side um, with you. Help us to focus on you, Lord, and to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. Amen. That is who you are. You are 
Thank you for leading us in worship there, Mike. The past couple of Sundays we've spent some time in the Psalms. We've looked at Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And it's brilliant to remind ourselves of the truth of who God is through these Psalms and to be encouraged by that and to, to delve into that a bit. But it's also true that not every Psalm has a happy ending. The Psalms show us the full range of human emotion, from joy to despair, from celebration to mourning, uh, anger, grief, repentance, you know, they're, they're all in there. And it's true that for many of the Psalms, you know, it's not, and they all lived happily ever after. There are Psalms of lament, there are Psalms of frustration, there are psalms crying out to God and questioning God. And there are psalms that speak of the goodness of God and the justice of God. But at the same time, there are other psalms that kind of cry out from a place of injustice and kind of seeing injustice and going, God, where are you in all of this? And it's on these themes of, of justice and injustice and kind of psalms that that don't end with a happy ending, but end with a question that I want us to spend a little bit of time in this morning. These are not easy days to be living in. And while we still choose to praise God through that, and in the middle of that, I think actually it is okay to bring our questions before God, to, to cry out to God and say, God, where are you in all this? Because we see that in the Bible. We see that in the Psalms. We see that in other places as well. And this morning we're going to explore uh, themes uh, around justice, around injustice, and around where is God in all of this, and what can we learn in the middle of all of this. And we're going to start that with something a little different this morning. We saw a good few weeks ago now uh, the shocking scenes coming out of America around the killing of George Floyd, and some of the protests and some of the movements that have come out of that. But then also in recent weeks in our own country, we've read of how uh, during lockdown, if you were a person of black, Asian or minority ethnicity, you were almost twice as likely to be fined uh, as if you were a white person. Before we get into the word, before we get into the Psalms this morning, there's an interview that we're going to share with you now that we recorded a couple of weeks ago. It's with Mabel Nyazika. She's the minister for the Methodist Church here in Partington, originally from Zimbabwe, 
and we just wanted to to ask Mabel how she has found uh, being over here around issues of uh, racism, justice, and and what can we learn, and how can we aspire to be people uh, of justice and compassion as God's people at this time. So in all that is shared, some of Mabel's own experiences and insights, uh, I pray that you'd be blessed by that. So we're delighted today to be joined by Mabel. So Mabel, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how long you've been in the UK, how, how you got here, all that kind of thing. First of all, my name is Mabel Nyasika, it's Jonathan has said, um, and I came from Zimbabwe. I worked in the Methodist Church in Zimbabwe before coming here for quite a long time. So I came in 2005 to study theology. But um, look at King House degrees are in contextual theology. So first of all, I had to ask uh, the sale Methodist circuit where I was resident and worshiping at the avenue if I could be uh, use the, the circuit as my context. Uh, and at that point, they lost a minister. They were, they were a three minister circuit. They lost a minister. So they employed two lay people, one to do administration and one to do pastoral work. So the two halves make a whole. And at that point, the, the sales circuit needed then to apply to immigration. So the rest is history. So they asked me where I wanted to live. I just walked the very first time when I walked into Partington. Um, the atmosphere was just like home. So that's how I came to, to, to live here and... and, and uh, work alongside the ministers uh, in the churches in the second. In the news a few weeks ago, we, we saw uh, news reports about the, the killing of George Floyd in America and then some of the protests in America, but also over here as a response to that. Um, as a black person yourself, what's been your response to, to what's been happening in America and to some of the issues that that's raised for us here in the UK? I thought I dealt with some of the issues, but the whole business of uh, the killing of George raised issues which I realized they were still there as far as I was concerned, which I'm going to tell you. There is straightforward racism where they tell you that they don't like you, right? As a person because that is um and i think this may be what i thought was happening with george and everybody else in america who is black there is a general suspicion that when you see a black person don't trust them they are either up to do something wrong to you or they want to rob you or they want to do something which is not legal so that that general suspicion between white people and black people is what causes uh, what I saw and what I, I lived with in Zimbabwe. So that is the one side. And then there's the other side which stems from that, which is very subtle, that whatever a black person does is not good enough. You have to work double or you have to perform two times better than everybody else to to, to be accepted um, and that is more painful than to be told that I don't like you, you're a black person because I think for me body language is very important and I hope also white people would value body language when you look at a person and you just dismiss them because sometimes when you are talking to people you may be the black person there they are talking across to each other they just bypass you they don't do it intentionally, but they just think perhaps you have nothing more to offer or whatever you offer is not good enough. Um, so that is generally what I think is the problem. And if only people can get to know the other person, then they will, all their, their preconceived ideas maybe may not 
may not re, uh, sort of influence them as to how they relate to the other person. When Martin Luther King said, I dream of a time when my children are not going to be judged by the skin, but by the content of their lives, which I think is very important. When people get to know somebody, they can know what kind of personality they are. With, with some of the events in America that highlighted a problem, you know, a, a huge, a huge societal problem. Is that something that you've experienced yourself here in the UK? And, and how might we combat these things? Um, just being honest, but the, you know, I told you the subtle one. Yeah. The, the, I haven't directly been made to feel I'm black in my interactions in the Methodist Church, uh, in, in Partington, I mean, I've never been, I mean, I sometimes come from church very late and I've never been threatened because I'm black. And yet it's so obvious that I'm not white. And, and I think people have just accepted me as part, part of the community. And I, I mean, I can't speak for black Britons they have to speak for themselves because they've lived here more than I do. But I think for them, what may be painful is that no one talks about how the, the first generation came here, how they lost their lives and everything and everything. And it is, it is uh, when you look at all the institutions, there are not that many black people uh, who are in influential positions. And yet they're very brilliant black people, black Britons who could do various things if they were. That may be systematic or insti in institutionalized racism of anything black cannot be considered. So direct racism, I've never felt it in this country. I think what I've experienced personally is the subtle one of just being told i mean some you may you may be in a conversation and somebody just thinks well we don't think of listening to black people are so aware i think for years they were at the receiving end of not being accepted as a human being mm -hmm. and and when you hear people saying black lives matter it's not that they are saying other lives do not matter because the white people have been at the receiving end, except the Jews, perhaps, who were at the receiving end of Hitler. But um, they are saying we are the ones who have been ill treated, not accepted as a proper human being, but our lives matter as well. That's really powerful. Obviously, we're we're in a majority white community. I think it's mm -hmm. about 90, 95 percent. Mm -hmm. um, white community here how do we keep this conversation going how do we make sure that you know this isn't just a, a reactionary thing to something that happened in america a few weeks ago how could we in in such a white community live for lasting change um what role do you think the church has to play in all that and are there any scriptures that in, inspire you in that you've already talked about Martin Luther King's dream, but um, yeah, sorry, loads of questions there. The whole understanding of we are cre we are all created in the image of God. I think that is where race relationships are concerned. There must be honest conversations. I hope you you can uh, catch the word honest. Once people invest time in getting to know the other person, whatever circumstances they are, that will help towards good relationship between races. I think if, if God is speaking to each one of us that you are my brother and my sister, you know, there's the uh, Paul's letter to the Romans that if anyone of you is caught in any act of which is not good you of faith help them right but be careful not to be uh to be tempted to do something which is not right in the process do we do that we don't 
uh, and what, what I was going to say, when you are talking honestly about the things which we have, which are different between us, it's painful. And are we prepared to hear the painful bits? Um, I think the, 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 the white Rhodesians who became my Christian sisters and brothers, we had to go through the painful conversations. Them accepting how they treated us for the part of my life. And me accepting them as they are. That's really, really helpful. I think, yeah, having, making space to have those painful conversations, to, to be able to have someone call out where we've caused pain to others. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the temptation is to not, to not want to go there. Yeah. But we, we have to go there if we want to be transformed, if we want to be changed people. Yeah. And, and the benefits are great. I mean, I remember Cynthia, um, Cynthia is, in, is a white Rhodesian. The day she decided she was going to have to, to put herself in front of my face and say all she wanted to say, she broke down and I broke down. She has found a sister in Christ, not a sister in the race, which is white and I'm black. Uh, but she can trust me because we there are things we, 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 we value between us. And I think in the church, like you were saying, that's where we have to, what would Christ tell you to do? What would Christ tell me to do? Um, I think that is, that is the, the foundation where we build relationships. Christ would not want me to look at you as a white person and Christ would not want you to look at me as a black person, but as two people who were redeemed by precious, by a precious blood. God did not, Christ did not die for white people alone. God, Christ did not die for black people alone. Christ died for humanity, whoever they are. So we wanted to share that just as a, a first-hand insight into injustice, into racism, uh, some of the subtle racism, some of the institutional racism. And just to help us to begin to think through, God, where, what are you saying to us in all of this? And to bring ourselves before God so that we could be people of justice and mercy. Not divided by the colour of our skin, but united by the blood of Jesus. As we think about injustice and racial injustice in particular there through Mabel, we're now going to move uh, to look at one of the Psalms. We're going to hear from Psalm 123. And this is a psalm that acknowledges that not everything is right in the world. Not everything is perfect at this point. And, and it's a psalm crying out to God for change. So let's hear it now. I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. As the eyes of slave look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he shows us mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us. For we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. Amen. We've just heard from Psalm 123, a psalm of looking to God, lifting our eyes to God, but also a psalm of crying out to God and saying, God, we've, we've had enough of this. God, when's this situation going to change? God, wh where are you in the middle of all this? And I think this is a psalm that's a really helpful lesson to us in living in the tension between two things that are both true but that don't but that we can't quite see the full picture of them at this moment in time there's this god you're good and we look to you and that's true and then there's also this god we've had enough of what's going on in life right now and that's true and we live in the tension of both of those things don't we and i think actually probably for so many of us thinking about 
uh, how, we're, how we're living in lockdown at this time. We're living in the tension between, God, this is what we know of you. This is what we believe of you. This is who we who you are. And we believe that and it's true. And then, God, this is our really difficult experience. And, God, we're struggling. And, God, would you come and intervene and would you do something? And that that's true as well. And I want to say to us this morning that it is okay to hold on to both of those things. I think it's important for us to acknowledge both of those things. If we if we just live, God, it's all amazing, we, we don't acknowledge the reality, and that's not a great place to be. But if we only focus on what's before us and don't acknowledge the greatness of God, that's not a great place to be either. It's We, we look to you, God, but we're struggling with this thing that's going on. We look to you, God, but actually this is a really tough thing that we're living in the middle of and that we're living through. God, this is what I know to be true of you, but God, this is our current reality. And it's okay to be in that place. We have permission. The you know, the word gives us permission to be in that place. In fact, some of the some of the Psalms are far worse than that in what they cry out to God. There's another Psalm that I just want to touch on briefly, Psalm forty four. And it's quite a long psalm. I'm not going to read the psalm. I'm not going to read the whole thing for us. But as you get to the end of Psalm 44, again, there's one of these "God, where are you?" kind of moments. There's an email coming in. All this has come upon us, but we've not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you've broken us in the place of jackals and covered us in the shadow of death. If we'd forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of our heart. Yet for your sake we're killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? Our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. It's another of these Psalms. It's like, God, you know, we haven't done anything wrong. God, we may, you know, maybe we could understand it if we were being punished for doing something wrong. But God, we've sought to live right before you. We've sought to follow you. We've sought to be obedient. We've sought to be your people. But it's all still rubbish. It's a really tough time. God, are you sleeping? God, are you distant? God, where are you? And, you know, these are psalms that don't end with her and they all lived happily ever after. These aren't psalms with a concluding verse that says, but isn't God good? Hip, hip, hooray. You know, they're psalms that, that live in the tension of the present moment and acknowledge the reality of the situation. God, we look to you. But God, this is really tough. So how are we to live as God's people in those times where it's really tough? How are we to live in those times, you know, Mabel has shared with us today about um, blatant racism, but also some of the more subtle racisms. I haven't experienced that myself, but how are we to be God's people? Crying out to God praising God, looking to God, but also acknowledging the difficulties of the current moment. And and maybe if you're a person who's experienced racism over and over again, institutional race, racism, subtle racism, uh, subconscious discrimination, you know, how do we keep looking to God and acknowledging the difficulties and the challenges and of saying, God, we've had enough uh, our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease. I think there's three things that I would want to encourage us to do at this time. One is that we look back to the cross. We look back to the cross. Mabel has shared with us this morning about the precious blood of Jesus that was not uh, poured out only for white people but poured out for all people that we could all be reconciled with God. Christ has died that all may come to the cross and find new life in him. 
that all could be invited to the cross and find new life in him. So for ourselves, we look to the cross. We look to the cross as the place where we ourselves have experienced grace and mercy and the forgiveness of God and new life in God. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, call out injustice when we see it. It doesn't mean that we can't call others to account when their behaviour or their actions or their attitudes have been wrong. But we can bring ourselves to the cross and we can say, God, I thank you that I have received mercy. God, whatever is going on in the world, I thank you that I have received mercy, that I've been forgiven for the wrongs I've done. I thank you, God, that I've been set free from sin and death. I thank you, God, that even though the world is a, is a bit rubbish in many ways at the moment, I have new life in you and your spirit lives in me and I've got the hope of eternity in my heart. David didn't look back to the cross because the cross hadn't happened yet, but we can look back to the cross and say, thank you, God, that even though this is the present reality, God, your unfailing love has reached my heart, has touched my life, has changed my life. We look back to what God has done in us and for us. We also look forward to eternity. We look forward to the day when the kingdom of God will come in all its fullness and where we'll be united with God as his people and where, where God will make all things new. If we see injustice now, I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm saying we look forward to the day where there will be justice. In Revelation 21, we see a vision of the future uh, revealed to John by Jesus. And, and John says this, he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people of God and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There'll be no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And while we live in the middle of difficulties, while we live in the, the middle of a tough global situation but also maybe difficult personal circumstances difficult cultural situation uh, you know if you've been on the receiving end of injustice uh, or discrimination or racism or whatever I'm not saying we'll just forget about that because it's all okay because the day's coming but I'm saying hold on because a day is coming hold on because the word promises us a new day where the old order, the current order, will pass away, where God will be with his people, where he'll rule with justice and mercy and compassion and he'll wipe away every tear. He'll wipe away every tear. And that day is coming. And every day we live is a day nearer to that day. We look back to the cross, what Jesus has done for us, and we look forward to eternity when we'll be united with with God in his kingdom, a new heaven and, new, and a new earth. And the last thing that I want to encourage us to do is to speak up. We speak up to God and we speak up to the world. We look back with thanks, we look forward with anticipation, but actually we don't stay silent. We don't stay silent when we see injustice. We don't stay silent when we see racism. We don't stay silent when when things are awful we speak up we speak up to god and we speak up to the world and if we think about the psalms being songs they were individual songs but they were also corporate songs they were songs of god's people and it's okay for us to sing these songs to god but also to sing these songs to the world and to say god where are you god we've had enough and to sing out to the world and say world it's not okay world watching world we've had enough our souls have had more than enough and we keep bringing that song to god we say god we look to you because god our souls have had enough 
God, we look to you because we know who you are. We know what you're like. We know what you've done. We know that you're the God who intervenes in this world, who changes situations, who changes hearts and minds. So God, we are going to keep bringing these things to you and we are going to keep raising these things with the world because we want the kingdom to come here. The Lord's Prayer teaches us, doesn't it? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And while we look forward to the day when all things will be made new, we pray for and we live for and we cry out for that day to come today. In our society, in our towns, in our cities, in our institutions, in our schools, in our universities, in our sports clubs, in our churches, whatever it might be. We look for the kingdom of God to come this day. So I want to encourage us from Psalm 123 this morning and from Psalm 44 as well. It's okay to bring your questions to God. It's okay to bring your frustration to God. It's okay to, to cry out to him and say, God, where are you in all of this? And we do all this looking back at what he's done, looking forward to what he's going to do and crying out to him on the basis of who he is because he is good. He is merciful, he is faithful, he's compassionate and kind. So let's pray together. Lord God, I pray that you would come in power in our lives, that we would be a people of justice and mercy and compassion. Lord, give us eyes to see the world as you see it. Give us hearts of compassion and mercy. Give us courage to speak out where things are wrong. And make us a people who continually look to you as our source of hope and inspiration at this time. God, we want to acknowledge the reality, but also we don't want to let go of you. We don't want to take our eyes off you. So God, have your way in our lives. Come Holy Spirit, fill us afresh. Let your kingdom come in our lives and let your kingdom come in our town and in the towns and the cities that we represent. Come and have your way, Lord. Amen. We're going to sing now. We're going to respond. We're going to lift our voices to God because he's good. And even though the psalm ends with that tension, we still fix our eyes on God and we look to him. So let's do that together.
service so far. We're now going to be heading back to Zoom to have our time of prayer and fellowship together. If you are uh, new to the church then please do get in touch um, to find out more via the website or the Facebook page and uh, we hope that you can join us again. Have a great week ahead. God bless.